the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Why did he use that word? God goes to extreme measures to bring the lost to himself. The greatest gift you will ever give this world is your intimacy with God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three inside of me. I've got the power right now. I think what Jesus really wants is people to go. I want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer request. Welcome to the Fuel for the Harvest podcast. When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. Hey everyone, and welcome to this latest episode of Fuel for the Harvest. This is Nathan, and I will be your host for today. And I have joining me the one, the only, Paul Epperson. Thanks so much for being here, man. Is that a heart? It looks like it's supposed to be a heart. Is that a heart? <laughs> Valentine's Day? Okay. Yeah. So. Oh man, we are really close to Valentine's Day. That's crazy. I'm glad I said that. <laughs> you know, you know what else today is? It's my son's first one month birthday. Yes. February 9th. January 9th. Oh my. There you go. He made Christ. it. Man, we we cool. learned how to be parents good enough that he made it one month. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Thanks for having me on, bro. I love being on here with you. We're we're so happy to have you, and uh, or I'm so happy to have you. But if Charlie was here, he would also say that he's happy to yes. have you. <laughs> <laughs> Missing him today. <laughs> yeah. So um, today we're going to be continuing in our conversation on deconstruction, specifically on the topic of the Bible. So if you listen to the episode last week, what you'll discover is we talked about all of the manuscripts and why we can trust that the words that are on the page, literally on the page, are the same words that Paul and Mark and Luke and John and other New Testament writers wrote 2,000 years ago. Uh, that they haven't been corrupted over time, that things haven't been selected out or added in. Um, and so if you're interested in that subject, be sure to listen to that podcast if you haven't already. The second way that we can evaluate, and, and the whole purpose of that is that we're trying to evaluate whether or not the Bible is trustworthy, because there's those who are deconstructing who are saying, you know, the reason I deconstructed, in fact, there's a, I have a family member, which I mentioned last week, um, who has deconstructed because of the Bible, um, basically being told her whole life, you know, the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, and then coming, going to a a, a university where they didn't teach that same thing and her whole faith just crumbling because the Bible stopped being this magic book. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I think that ultimately this conversation could go a thousand different ways. <laughs> I affirm that the Bible is inerrant. Paul, I'm sure you do as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I also affirm that it's inspired by God, <clears throat> but I think the conversation is more complicated than just simply like, like you, if you're thinking of the Bible as coming down out of heaven in a pillar of light, then you're thinking of the Bible incorrectly. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. And certain certain people believe that that's how it happened in certain religions, you know, and then you can't find it anywhere, anywhere anymore in a different language that nobody's ever heard of. So but right. I agree with you. Yeah. Right. So the, the Bible is a uniquely divine book, but it's also, I would say it is quintessentially Emmanuel, meaning uh, it is God with us. Uh, we've talked about this before, but for example, when God's talking to Job, when he's re rebuking Job at the end, he says, were you here when I laid the cornerstone or put the earth on its foundation? Now, we know that the earth doesn't have foundations or a cornerstone, but Job thought legitimately, uh, most scholars think that Job had that worldview, that the world really was set on pillars and had a dome over the top um, and and had a cornerstone and so on and so forth. So God wasn't God wasn't speaking to Job in a scientifically accurate way because he wasn't concerned with explaining the science of the universe to Job. He was concerned with rebuking him and saying, hey, you're not God. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right. And so the Bible engages with humanity uh the words of god engage with humanity wherever they're at so it's that's why i use that word i mean yeah. anyway sorry we got way off subject there no it's great because <laughs> it's a great point nathan i mean god engages with us he didn't have to do that but i mean the fact that i need a reminder every day this sounds terrible i ain't god and i don't have all the answers i don't know everything so i have to go to him and uh so i think that's great yeah so Today, we are talking about the second way that we can evaluate whether or not the Bible is trustworthy. And the way that we do that is, does it, there's two tests. The first one is coherence, which means 
from the front from the from genesis to revelation is there anything that like super disagrees with the rest of the book is there anything that's an obvious contradiction um is there anything theologically speaking where uh in one part of the book this is theologically true and then it stops being true and then this other thing is like from from the from genesis to revelation is it coherent and then the second test is correspondence so does the bible match the world around us um so let's talk first about coherence uh paul from your experience when people say the bible is not trustworthy because it's full of contradictions mm -hmm. how do you respond yeah no, i think it's a great question well let me say this this here's a phrase that i use is that um let, let us not give more detailed questions in search to textbooks than we do the Bible. If you mm -hmm. read something in school and they say something, you're going to go ask a teacher and go, hey, is that, that true? And then you're going to go from there. The Bible, if you look at something one time and go, wait a minute, it says this here and then there's somewhere, you know, another, and then it's not true. And we throw our hands up and push it away. I think because deep down um, the, the sin in us is trying to push it away. We don't do that with textbooks for the most part. <laughs> so I'm not going to give more weight to a textbook than I do to the Bible. Here's what I say to people. Um, uh, pay attention and take your time, right? Mm -hmm. Give it even more weight because it's more important. Um, so when somebody looks at one thing and go, oh, that's a contradiction, um, look at it and go, um, this is the Bible. I'm going to give God the benefit of the doubt. I always tell people all the time, give God the benefit of the doubt <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and take your time with it. Um, so that's the main thing. So so in, let the Bible interpret the Bible. So if something in the Old Testament doesn't seem like it matches up something in the New Testament, take your time to think through it and look at it and ask the right questions on it. And don't come to a quick conclusion because mm -hmm. Jesus, God says, seek me and find me. And you'll do that when you seek me with all your heart mm -hmm. and so apparent contradictions don't signify an equal contradictions mm -hmm. right and that's what i just always remind people of that agreed and i would say that when it comes to biblical interpretation context is king yes so the 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 words that surround the words that are in question those are pertinent yes. the the book that surrounds the words that are in question. Those are pertinent. The 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 historical context. So when was this book written? Where where in redemptive history? And when I say redemptive history, I mean God's pursuit, God's desire to redeem humanity from Genesis to Revelation. Where in that storyline does this book occur, or this verse in question occur? Um, all of those things will give you understanding. Yes. I had one time. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go. I, I, well, want to hear. I had one time. I love what you said. I had one time when I was a teacher, a student come up to me and, and I, and I did, did some different Bible classes to where we were trying to understand the Bible as a whole. We we're trying to put it, see it put together context, those types of things. <laughs> she said, she goes, I, I'm just getting kind of mad. She goes, the Bible is supposed to be easy. And mm -hmm. uh, I think, yes, in some ways, the Bible is simple enough for children to get it and understand. Let the little children come to me. But it is so deep and complex because we're going after God, right? Mm -hmm. But God's not hiding things from us on purpose, trying to like, aha, you're never going to find this. He wants to be found, right? right. And so, but I, but I think when we when we want something and long for something, we go after it. We do it in everyday life, but we give up so quickly when it comes to God. I don't know if it's because we feel stupid because we're made to feel stupid because we don't think we can understand it. But the Bible is a historical book. It's a book that we can understand about who God is. So. Amen. And oh, man, I was going to say something to add on to that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the, remember, one uh, one month old baby. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, it's green. It's just not. I was, was going to say it was something about bacon. That always triggers my mind when I figure. Oh, I got it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, oh, the, that's the other thing. There, See, we, <laughs> just like your student is saying, we want the Bible to be easy. I okay. So I have two thoughts on that. First thought is I feel like in evangelicalism or in just modern Christianity in general, we've kind of gone about teaching people about the Bible all wrong. Um, we have said, hey, it, you know, just get into it, just get into it, because we're so desperate to get people into God's word, which is great. Don't hear me wrong. You should be in God's word. But also that should come with a, a warning of, hey, there, there is weighty things in here and it takes time to understand it. So yes. don't get down on yourself if you're like, I read it, I read it once through and I just don't get it. Yes, um, absolutely. I love 
when Adrian is speaking about the Bible and in his messages, he's always talking about his own personal struggle of how he really had a hard time understanding it the first time. Mm -hmm. So he asked people who knew more and yeah. like that really, really helped him. And now I would say Adrian's probably one of the most intelligent biblical scholars I've ever met. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is we have another context that we have to account for. Mm -hmm. We don't speak Greek and we don't live 2000 years ago. That's right. And because we don't live in that cultural context and because we don't speak Greek, there's just certain things that are more difficult for us to understand than somebody like Timothy receiving yeah. that letter from Paul, first or second Timothy, like he would have read that, immediately understood its meaning, understood its intent, and then moved on with life. Whereas we being separated by time, oh, and by the way, geography, like thousands of miles for most of us, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Like, because we're so separated from it, we have to understand the world in which Timothy walked in order right. to understand what Timothy heard when he was reading Paul's letter. That's right. Yeah. And I, I love that so much, Nathan, because, you know, I hear all people all the time ask, oh, can you prove the Bible scientifically? I'm like, well, if the Big Bang is real, you can't prove it scientifically either. No offense, sure. because the way that science does their things of, of, you know, doing a little thing here, writing it down, doing it here, writing it down. You can't right. tell if I ate in a cafeteria last week scientifically, but you can't historically. <laughs> Right. And so I think that's the key when we come to the Bible. We're always science is a servant to God. I love science. I think it is such a gift from God. I love the things that we're coming. We, we have more we can do now than just about any time, it seems like. But I think we have to keep it in perspective. This is a historical book and this really happened in history. And I always hear people all the time go, well, there's not enough evidence for the Bible. Like if you if you were to Google like evidence of the Bible, you're going to see people go, there's no evidence. There's no evidence. There's, and there's tons of other people that say there are no evidence. What I have found is this. You ready? Is that you will not find evidence that you're not looking for mm -hmm. right so people go we've done archaeological digs we haven't found nothing because you weren't looking for it mm -hmm. right you were looking to try to disprove things about the bible i think there's so much really cool evidence that that god's word really is the word of god that helps us in our everyday life that we can relate to um so yeah i, I agree with you man i think there's just it's so neat that the bible is such a it's such a practical application to our lives it's given me the, the the lens through which i can see and live like i you know, all that kind of stuff anyway i just think there's a lot of great things that, that if we're really looking for it um we'll see that man this word is so cool you know amen and and we don't want to scare you off of the scriptures either i, no, I, know, I know that's not my intent here um and paul hasn't said anything that would scare you off i've been the one who you. <laughs> anyway, um you have access especially if you speak english but even if you speak other language I, I i assume if you're listening to this podcast you at least speak a little bit of english um you have unprecedented unprecedented like never before in history resources that will help you to understand the scriptures yeah. um some of my very favorites are your run-of-the-mill study bible if you just read the front of your the, each book of the study Bible or the footnotes under the study Bible, it will give you so much cultural insight. Mm -hmm. It will give you so much contextual insight. And you'll be like, oh, 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 it makes sense. <laughs> Second resource I just point you to, uh, and I, 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 I throw this at you knowing that not everything that they say is something that I even would necessarily agree with, but I still think they're a great resource called the Bible Project or Bible Project now. Um, they have great videos that give you an overarching picture of each book of the Bible. Before Taylor and I, uh, every night we read the Bible, if we start a new book, before we read that book, we always watch the Bible Project video. Great resource. And it, it brings a huge amount of understanding because, for example, we're reading Ezra the other night, and <clears throat> Ezra has these anticlimaxes, like uh, the the leaders in 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 that time period are doing things that that God wouldn't necessarily be happy with. And you're reading it, and you're like, "Oh man, this doesn't seem like it matches the heartbeat of God." But they're saying that this is what pleases the Lord when God never actually said, "This is what pleases me." What He yeah. said pleases me is the opposite of what they're doing. So, for example. In Ezra, uh, any any of the people who come back from the Babylonian exile who marry a non-Jewish person, Ezra says it it pleases the Lord for you to divorce your non-Jewish wife, and so they go through like there's this whole chunk of the scriptures where they of the book of Ezra where they're divorcing their wives because they're pagan, and 
I'm like, oh man, that doesn't really match the heartbeat of God. And as I'm reading through it, I'm like, God hates divorce. Jesus makes that really clear. And I'm like really questioning this. Yeah. So I, I go to the Bible project video and they're like, oh yeah, look at all these other minor prophets and major prophets of the Old Testament from the same time period who are saying exactly the opposite. And take note that God never, it, just because Ezra says it pleases the Lord doesn't mean that's what God said. It, God never said it. So it's just little contextual details like this that you can really learn and glean from the from people who have a, a bigger picture than you do. Yes. Yeah. I think those are great resources. And I agree, Nathan, to anybody that, that's going to be an earshot or, or listening, um, these things are meant to to draw you near so that when you get there and you want to throw your hands up to go, man, this is too hard, or maybe this is exciting, you keep going, but you don't give up. Um, right. Because God's after you knowing him and understanding. Understanding really is what the Spirit of God's all about. He wants us to understand because as Jesus would say, that's what bears fruit, 160, 30 fold. When you get it and you receive it, and you're like, this is awesome. And you understand it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, too, you know, the um, like what Nathan was talking about with some of these projects, how do they how do they know? How do they know that this is what it was like? And I'm just going to say this real simply <laughs> because these are real places. <laughs> They're real people. So I love about study Bibles. You don't have it on the on the Bible, like the phone app or whatever. But in the back of my Bible, my ESV study Bible is uh, there's maps, you know, because you can go to these places. These are real places with real people in history. And uh, if you want to go to some of the New Testament cities that we read about in Acts, go to them. They're there. <laughs> right. I've been to the to the uh, the, the place where Peter was kept in prison. Mm -hmm. you know, I've watched walk some of those places where Paul walked. They're real places. You want to go? Jericho has been found. Nineveh. There's excavations. They do the thing one time said uh, they said the wall couldn't have crumbled like that. I was kind of like skeptics. Yeah, there's no there's no way. Well, they they excavated Jericho and they went, oh. It did, <laughs> you know, and it crumbled in a really bizarre way. Too. In a really bizarre way. It was unique. Yeah. They wanted to uh, find Daniel. They found, they excavated the Babylon site. They found so many different things that are going to show us, y'all. These are real places. You mm -hmm. can go there, <laughs> you know. So I think that is why when you say, "Well, how can the Bible project?" They, they know all these things because they have people that have went there, <laughs> right? And they've used the Bible as their guide. And I just think, y'all, the Bible is our main resource in what we're doing. So. Amen. And if you come across an apparent contradiction, believe it or not, there's probably an answer for it. And there's probably been an answer for it for like hundreds, if not thousands of years. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, we are not the first people to be looking at the Bible through a critical lens, meaning, and I don't mean like a harsh critical lens. I mean, we're not the first ones to be looking at it and being like, why does this not match this? Asking those questions. Yes. Uh, people have been doing this for a very, very long time. And there's very good answers out there for, for almost every kind of apparent contradiction that you might come across. Yeah. Um, the, the, biggest, the biggest failure that people make is in trying to force the Bible to be a book that it isn't. Because the Bible's not just one book. It's 66 separate books that all have the same message, but they're written from different perspectives. They're written with different intents. They're like, there's all of these complex layers that lead the author to write one thing versus another thing. Um, and so when you're reading in 1 Samuel, and then you're reading in 1 Chronicles, and you're like, whoa, 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 I just read about this and it's totally different here. It's all about perspective. It's all about how Chronicles was written by a different guy than First Samuel kind of thing. And it's all about how the intent of the writer of First Chronicles is different than the intent of the writer of First Samuel. And uh, when you're reading in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and which are commonly referred to as the synoptic, synoptic Gospels because they, 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 I guess they synapse. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, when you're reading through these and you're like, well, I thought it was this many people or I thought it was this many people. Uh, those things are easy, easy to understand. This particular author highlighted one. This particular author highlighted three. I mean, it's not beyond it. It's not like intellectually dishonest to just say, oh, yeah, it, they're just they're t retelling stories from different perspectives. And so there's. It, don't get, don't get worried the first time you come across something you're like oh oh i found oh it's broken i found yeah. you know like no no Absolutely. no yeah so you're, you're 
A, you're not the first person to find it, and B, there's definitely an answer. So yeah. just do a little research. Yeah. Absolutely. And I often wonder, Nathan, what would happen if, if, and I know different cultures are different in how they view things, right? But I, I would say from where the culture that, that we're in right now, I mean, what would happen in the difference? Would it, would it be if we came to the Bible and, and just simply said, I don't understand it all yet, but I'm going to search this as it's as being true because mm -hmm. my belief doesn't make the Bible true. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I didn't make it. It's making me, so to speak. But but instead of going to the Bible of going, I'm going to say, all right, pro prove it, prove yourself right. Mm -hmm. Like that, that the, to me, that that's that kind of skepticism is going. You can find anything and turn you away really quickly. But what if I humble myself and says, this is the Bible. It has stood the test of time. People have tried to take it out. People have tried to destroy it. People have tried to change it. People. And you just fill in the blank. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and go, what if I came to the Bible every day and go, this is God's word. This is truth. Or teach me who you are. And if you did that, right, if you started it with going, it's true first, and then every other question that you might have falls under that line, right? One one thing at a time, instead of going, that's the thing ain't true. Ah, everything's not going to look true when you do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just a different perspective. And I think that's the reason why Jesus says in the Bible, in John 14, he goes, I am the truth. And when we're searching truth, I'm going to start with the Bible. I'm going to start with Jesus because he said that he was. He's the only one that I know of in my life. And, and Gandhi said this. And he wasn't a believer in this, but he he says, I just I just amazed him. He goes, I've never met a man or a teacher that said that that if I came to him, he would give me rest for my soul. Mm -hmm. Jesus has given me what I could never get anywhere else. And that's not subjective. I'm not saying he made me feel something. I may not have understood everything about when I when I came to, to Christ, but when I heard the news about him, maybe for the thousandth time, it clicked. Right. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus would say, you got to be born again, born from above. It's got to be born in you. That happened to me. And what I found is that I didn't just believe something subjectively like who had the tingles or I had bad tacos the night before, which I didn't have <laughs> bad tacos, but I did have tacos last night. Anyway, but, okay. but what I have found is that over these last 23 years that this this just light belief that I had back then. Now I realize it isn't it didn't get stronger because, oh, the word got better. No, no. It was always true. <laughs> there's that historical accuracy, archaeological evidence. There's the empty. There's all these things for that. The Bible has just proven itself to be true all of these years before I was ever born. That little faith has simply grown into a bigger faith on what was always proven to be true in the first place. So, Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Couldn't but you got to go on your journey. You got to go on your journey, right? <laughs> you know, uh, growing up, I always heard the Bible referred to as God's word. And I always kind of thought of that in the, in the nature of it being a title like this is a this is just what we call it it's god's word yeah. but recently i've started using the phrase god's words because it's not it's not just a title it's a description mm -hmm. these words belong and are from god and uh just to re-emphasize what you're saying like we can take them at face value um not 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 without doing the heavy lifting of understanding what it's the, the real intent and blah, 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 all that stuff. But we can take them at face value and say, God, these are your words. And I trust that these are your words and I'm going to trust you kind of thing. And uh, I think that that is really an important step um, for, for each of us to take. And that don't, don't hear Paul and I wrong. We're not trying to say, like, if you're a skeptic listening to this, we're not trying to indoctrinate people <laughs> into no, just no. into just not using their brain. That's not mm -hmm. what we're saying. We're just saying, hey, there's a weightiness here. There's a heaviness. There's a there's a a a, di a divine factor here that should be taken into consideration. Yeah, that's good. And I think on, on top of that, Nathan, I'm, I'm glad you said that because you, God calls us to love us, go love Him with all our hearts and our minds. And our souls and our strength. So I would say to people that, that may be going, I don't know. I say start where you are. Meaning if you think there's no archaeological evidence for the Bible, well, start there. Mm -hmm. Right. Start with the Old Testament and the New Testament. I mean, you'll find Old Testament alone. There's twenty five thousand and counting sites and things of discoveries that, that have been found. And, and I'm not going to go into them here because there's just it's just too many. It's just exciting. Go to the New Testament. And there's so much. There's just as more. Heck, you can go walk those streets. If, if it's not archaeological, then go, well, maybe it's historical. I mean, how do I then start there uh, mm -hmm. for, for somebody else to go? No, I, maybe it's the resurrection. I don't know of Jesus. How do I know? Then start there. <laughs> right. Start where your doubt is. Start where you are. 
right? And I'd say go from there. And I think one of the biggest things that just kind of turns us off is that we're trying to figure out everything all at one time. I get turned off by that. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> and I've learned, maybe that's personality, but I've learned start with one thing and go there. And if you don't get a satisfactory answer yet, then go somewhere else and keep letting God put those pieces together over time. And I think that's a, that's what I always tell people. Start where you are and move on from there. Yep. How do you eat? How do you eat an elephant? Not that we would, but how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. One bite. At <laughs> you, you ain't gonna. You're not gonna disjoint your jaw and swallow it all at once. It's That's just right. not. It's a little tiny body is not gonna take a big old elephant in all at once. You got to eat it one bite at a time. And right. I think the same thing is true with the Bible. Um, just take one step at a time and don't get so don't get overwhelmed in the mass. All right, so let's move on. So we talked about coherence. The fact that the Bible is coherent from Genesis to Revelation in all that it says and claims. And then correspondence. That that test is how much does the Bible match reality? So Paul has already begun hitting on this, which I really appreciate, which is to say that the Bible has archaeological evidence to support it. Um, but there's also a lot more to this conversation. Mm -hmm. A lot more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh the let let's let's specifically hit on um archaeology first yep. so i just want to add this caveat mm -hmm. archaeology helps us to know that what is written in the bible it corresponds to reality what it doesn't help us know is the theological claims of the bible being true or false right. so when people will say archaeology can prove the bible well it can prove that David was a real person, or it can prove that Jesus really walked the earth. What it can't prove is that Jesus really is the son of God, for sure. example. So uh, just, just keep that in mind as we go through this, because uh, we don't want to uh, improperly arm you, because uh, yeah. our goal is to arm you and equip you to be kingdom laborers wherever your feet take you. So if you go up to a skeptic and be like, archaeology proves the bible they're going to look at you especially if they understand the conversation and they're going to be like no it doesn't so i just want to make sure that you're aware that's right they're they're technically correct but what it does do is it helps us to know that the bible is not pointing to it it's not it's not just a collection of fairy tales these that's things right. actually and these people actually existed and these things actually did happen all right yeah. go ahead well no i mean i i think that uh, i mean like nathan said you know y'all there's a. Uh, we consider and say there's tons of evidence. I think, you, you know, if this is something that, that, that you want to know, um, there are tons and tons of, of resources, not just online. Right. I mean, there's tons of those. But I mean, you can I mean, we, we can give you some other uh, uh, links later on. But, um, you know, y'all, when you go just to the Old Testament, um, y'all and I mentioned it earlier. I mean, you've got Babylon. You know, with what Daniel spoke of, you've got Nineveh, Nahum spoke of that. Um, you've got Jericho, which we mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, you've got Dan and Haran. You've got uh, what Abraham was in Haran, yet Ur. All of these sites have been excavated. And so I'm just going to share that with you because the, the site test, right, D meaning are there places that are in the Bible that have been found? Because we know time and, you know, just different things can shift stuff or whatever. But there's a lot of those places. And I need you to understand there's a lot of those places because they're real places and this is just old testament right so i mean have are there you know pieces of uh you know pottery and coins and inscriptions yes and dan they found an inscription dating back to the to the time of david and solomon's kingdom that had the inscription david king of israel or the house of david i mean those types of things are in new are numerous right and i'm not going to go into all that here you can keep looking at that but that type of stuff y'all is so so numerous there, there's one i thought was really interesting there's one called the cyrus cylinder now why that's important is because when isaiah talks about cyrus you're looking at about 150 years or so they mentioned the name cyrus long before cyrus was ever it <laughs> was ever around some people would go uh maybe they wrote that after cyrus that makes sense no but the cyrus cylinder shows you that it was dated back to when isaiah would have written it himself 150 years before cyrus ever came into the thing no god did that but that's been found Right. That's that that's there. Um, you got a, a tablets we have like uh, what well, you have the uh, was it the uh, the Ebla tablet. Now you think, well, what is that? Well, real quick. This is why it's important. A lot of people would say that that the, the people before Moses, like that time period beforehand, early Genesis were morons and beyond. Right. They didn't know how to write. They didn't have a written language. 
this you can't trust the Genesis accounts. OK, so typically from Genesis one that we know are really Genesis one to eleven that we know of. Now, I understand the days you know one through six and then before all that, I, but roughly about 2000 years of history. OK, mm -hmm. and then Genesis 12 on the, then the Genesis about 250 years and you got the Exodus with Moses for 50, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, but but the Ebla tablet, what we found is that it, it dates to a thousand years before Moses. So which shows you here's what's important, that there was a written language. Right. Mm -hmm. They knew they were smart. Yeah, we look at them and go. These were like I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Geico cave commercials, but you know they were like Ugh. you know they weren't like that. These were real people that were brilliant, that knew how to write, that knew they had their own written language, all that kind of stuff. But we have that right. That's all. Of, I mean, we have so much of this type of of stuff and evidence archaeologically um, that that it might say it doesn't prove the Bible, but man, does it give some really neat weight that the things that the Bible are saying have that weight that God is it's a historical book. God is going, Hey, you can go to Babylon and look at that. You can go to Jericho and see if the walls did fall that way. That was unique. It was different. So anyway, I'm just saying there's a lot of those um, types of things. There's, there's these posts they found it and went under with Solomon's reign that they had these, they, they said, what are these things? They're large posts, these big rings, lots of them. And you realize when you read the Bible, they were, that's where he put his horses at. He tied his horses up to those things. I mean, stuff like that. Y'all we found, they found, um, uh, uh, Hezekiah's tunnel in second Kings that was mentioned. So you see what I'm saying? Like, I'm not trying to bore you with all the details. I'm just saying, if, if you want to know some archeological things, it's there. And that's just the old Testament. You go to the new Testament, y'all we've got, they found a first century crucified man that was intact to show you that that exactly how the Bible says they would have crucified somebody during that time. That's mm -hmm. there. Um, you want to find, they got uh, Caiaphas is ossuary. I mean, they got places where looked under his place was like a dungeon and stuff like that was there. You got inscriptions of Pontius Pilate uh, being the ruler that he was during that time. Um, Artemis is theater. I mean, you can walk those streets, right? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I, I'm just t saying that it's kind of exciting <laughs> if we really think about it, how much evidence is there archeologically um, for us to go, let's take a logical look at some of these things and go, okay, if this is, this is showing me here that what the Bible said exactly the same way that this was happening, that might promote some belief in my life. So. Amen. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's really cool. The, the deeper you dive, uh, I was doing some research for this podcast and everything that Paul mentioned just now, that's just like the top 10. Oh, like yeah. those are like there there's when he says thousands, he's not exaggerating. Um, I will just give you guys this caveat with archeology. span There was a time in recent history, like the last hundred years where they thought David wasn't real. They mm -hmm. thought there's no archeological evidence to support that David's a real guy. Guess what? They found something within the last hundred years, the Tel Dan Stella or whatever yep. it's called, right. Stell, uh, which is what Paul talked about, where it's it's the Greek or yeah, Greek or Hebrew letters for House mm -hmm. of David. Um, uh, and they make a very compelling case that that's what it's saying, the House of David. And uh, they, so now we know that David was, in fact, a real guy. Like he's not, he's not just this figmental, it's not a made up story. It's not a, you know, blah, blah, blah. but that just happened. Like mm -hmm. just happened. Uh -huh. So uh, we don't know how long Jesus will wait to come back, but I, but here's my bet. The more time that goes by, the more they dig ancient Israel and Palestine and all of those areas, the more they'll find that supports the biblical narrative. That's right. So far, archaeologists are like I, I read um one quote that basically said uh there's nothing that has contradicted the scriptures overtly um yeah. there's nothing that they've found that contradicts now archaeology is a very subjective thing yeah, like you can make something say whatever you want because it's out of context you mm -hmm. can pick something up and be like oh this must be this because you're trying to fit it to a uh, your your already established like line of thinking, but all that to say, uh, even amidst all of the debate, there is an answer for every question that has been brought to light. And when it comes to archaeology, and archaeology always always points to the affirmational truth that what is written in the Bible is accurate and true. That's right. Yeah. And here's the thing. It's something that we have to deal with. Right. There's something regardless. You could go, well, I don't like archaeology. That's fine. But it's there. 
and and it's not something that we're trying to make up or whatever. I'm not going, well, I'm going to try to make, like you said, I'm not trying to make this thing up so I make it sound good because like you said, it doesn't prove it, but it gives some weight to what's already been written. And yes. uh, I think the biggest archaeological thing for me personally, and I'm sure for a lot of people, um, is is the empty tomb. And yeah. I think, you know, you can go see it. And I think that's to me the, the, some of the biggest stuff when you go to, you know, the birthplace of Jesus, you go to Jerusalem, you go to that, you, you can see all these things for yourself. And uh, so I don't know. I just think there's just a lot. And for me, that doesn't push me away. It's really exciting. And, um, you know, for me, when I came to Christ, I'm just going to throw this out there. I, I was not on this. I, for me, it was not. Let me go find the art. That wasn't me. Like I've learned now that I've learned it. I'm like, I'm so much more pumped about this. But early on, I didn't care. Like I was just that wasn't what I was. That wasn't my I, I wasn't interested in that. I wasn't even interested in the historicity of the Bible. I wasn't interested. You know, those are phenomenal. But for me, I was weighted down with my sin. Right. And I knew it. And I knew that I was living in ways that God didn't approve of and I couldn't shake it. And so when I finally heard the news for like a hundred thousandth time, it seemed like it clicked. And I realized that I needed Christ. And if, if he was dead, it didn't make any difference to me. Like that first century man they found that was still intact on the cross. If he was still there, then it didn't make any difference to me. But if he was alive then I could have that relationship with him. And that for me is where I, I began to come alive. And now all the other things that we're talking about have really taken you know, central place in my heart and my life because it's just continued to build and affirm the things that, that Jesus said he is the truth. So, amen. Uh, the, the, the more you get into uh, these conversations about apologetics, which is just a fancy word to, for defense of faith, uh, the more you'll see that for many Christians, that empty tomb is the quintessential the quintessential apologetic, the, the the central idea that says this is why, from an intellectual perspective, I believe what I believe, because Jesus really did rise from the dead, which I think is just absolutely, like, by far the most compelling case. And, um, but that's not to discount all of this other stuff, no, no, no. because here's what happens when you zero in on just one thing. It begins to become, it, you begin to develop a lot of questions about that one thing. But when you take the entire body of evidence, it really, like, and it is all pointing in the same direction that you can trust the Bible as a historical book, that Jesus really did rise from the dead. That's when you, when you take that big picture perspective, you're like, oh, I get it. Zoom out a little bit. Zoom out to you know five, maybe not twenty five thousand feet or thirty thousand, but but zoom out to five hundred feet or five thousand feet. And what you'll discover is there is this incredible, huge, mega body of evidence that supports the that the Bible is is full of real events. It's a historical document that points to true things. Uh, Bart Eerdman, is that the right name? Mm -hmm. He's a skeptic. Uh, outspoken biblical skeptic and even he has come to the conclusion that you have to take the bible as a historical document um so just keep that in mind uh paul hit on the the resurrection here uh if you want proofs of the resurrection just google them also we've done two or three episodes where yeah. we hit the proofs of the resurrection um and you can check out previous episodes uh there is uh, depending on who you talk to, between five and twenty. So uh, it's just is how they 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 talk about and think about the evidence. Um, the other the other thing that I really wanted to hit on here was how does the Bible correspond to the world in which we live? Mm -hmm. um, I would I would make this claim that the Bible clearly communicates truths that we can see in our everyday life. And even if the Bible wasn't saying it, it would still be true kind of thing. Um, so the fact that we see it and it's true and it and the Bible is seeing it and it's true uh, is proof, uh, like in my mind, that the Bible is a trustworthy document. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that, Nathan, because I agree with you, man. It, it gave me a framework in which to think. So when I was trying to figure out the things that were going on internally and externally around me, when I when I went to the Bible, I understood, oh, that's what that is, right? Mm -hmm. And don't, don't get me wrong, I searched in a lot of different places and I'm not discrediting other things, but what I am saying is there's a credit to when I go, when God talks about, here's my problem, it's sin, I get that now, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to really wrestle with that to go, I don't know about that. <laughs> because if I'm honest, I really like doing my thing my way. 
and I do. And um, but it helped me understand that's why I had these tendencies. That's why I was doing this. That's why I would go this way. That's why I thought this way. That's why. Right. And uh, and then it, and then it kind of gave me a solution to that. And, and I realized that what I was really longing for, and I would be willing to, to suggest that no matter what it is, whether somebody's looking at something, whether somebody's searching for something, I think we're all searching for God because the Bible does tell me that. And because it helped me understand that what I was really wanting was something greater than just the creation. I really was wanting the creator. And I didn't, I didn't get that. And when I did, it began to click. And, and then it was, how do I treat people? Why do people act that way? Why do I respond when people act that way? I think the Bible gave me the framework and the understanding. Uh, and the only reason I can know that is because of the creator. If I have a broken iPhone, I don't take it to, to, to the person next door that doesn't know anything about iPhone. I go to the creator, right? I go to the store. I go to the, to the manual. And I think I had to, I had to realize that, that God was giving me the manual because he was the creator. And that has helped me understand all of life far better. Um, so that, that's me personally you know, in that. So, yeah. Amen. Um, here's, here's one specific that you might find helpful, uh, sin. So we believe as Christians and the Bible teaches that sin is inherent in our DNA, if you will. Um, it's just part of who we are as pre reborn Christians, um, <laughs> pre born again. Sorry. Let's use the double <laughs> language. Um, so it's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's ingrained. And uh, I think this is easily observable um, mm -hmm. in in children. So uh, if you're a parent or a much older sibling, you'll you'll you remember uh, that you didn't have to teach your kid how to be selfish. You didn't have to teach your kid how to be greedy. You didn't have to teach your kid how to be mean. You, you know, or, time, how to, or how to or how to bite or how to pinch or how to you know whatever hurt somebody. You didn't have to teach your kid any of those things. Um, and I know it's a really simple illustration, but for me, that really indicates that this, this core teaching of the scriptures, that sin is inherent in who we are, is clearly observable in the world around us. Yeah, that's good. It taught me that the problem was within me. It was me, so to speak. Yeah. And like I love you said, I was just talking yesterday with my wife. We're like, remember the time when my, my daughter was like, oh, uh, did you eat that chocolate cake? And she's got chocolate cake all over her mouth. She's yeah. like, no. You didn't eat that chocolate cake? No. <laughs> no. You're right. It, it's not taught. It's within. And right. that's why I think there's so much like what you're saying is that we we're searching for the answers within ourselves and we have to admit that we are the problem and it's inside of us. You can't wash that stuff off. And the Bible helped me to see that because so much around us is going, oh, no, no, just keep searching within. Just keep trying harder. Just keep, you know, you got to clear your mind or whatever. And that stuff just is not it, it, it's not um, it's not uh, applicable to all of my life. You know, and so anyway, yeah. So I'd say sin too, Nathan, in that is going is that our bent is to, to doubt God. Did God really say that? Well, we've talked about that before in Genesis three. But I think that's part of the sin is pride and unbelief, a refu stubborn refusal to take God at His word and think I know better. So, absolutely. And uh, are there are there any other kind of big picture ways that you would say really stand out to you as like here's a teaching from the scriptures that really corresponds to your experience? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's multiple ones, I think, Nathan. But one, I mentioned it earlier when Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for my yoke, which means, I think my teaching, my yoke is easy and my burden is light and you will find rest for your souls. In a culture of when he said that, and I'd say in our culture too, there are so many different types of teachings, but they're weighing us down. We promise that promises freedom just brings just a weightiness to our souls, right? It's not it's not the freedom that God's promised. And so I think that that the idea of when I came to Jesus, when Jesus said he would do that, I was at a stage in my life where I tried it all. I thought through it all. And and he I believe to this day, the peace still remains no matter what I go through. Mm -hmm. And because his teachings um, enable me to understand what it looks like to love my neighbor as myself. His teaching helps me understand what it means to love my neighbor as myself. His teaching helps me understand how to love my wife as he loved the church. His teaching helps me understand about purpose and meaning, which I so longed for. Like, I got to know what my purpose. Well, I why, what, what am I here for? Um, and I think I have personally, I can wake up each day knowing that I have found that in Christ because he is my life and, uh, and I'm hidden with him. And so I think for me personally, that was a big one is that I finally found rest for my soul. I'm not talking about for my emotions. I'm talking about for my soul, 
as Augustine would say, you know, you, we are restless until we find our rest in him. He is the only one that I've found that can give me true rest for mm. my soul. And I think that's been a big deal. And in a, in a culture, in a world that is so restless, that is so anxious, that is so afraid, um, I think that, that we must come to the one that has calmed the storm and the sea. And he's done it in me as well. So, Amen. Yeah, I uh, I feel like the the one that corresponds the most for me is uh, for Christians all across history, but many, many modern Christians who are facing extreme obstacles, uh, they have this piece about them. Now, obviously, you can't just go with this one piece of information to a skeptic <laughs> and be like, yeah, Christians have peace when nobody else does. Like, they're going to be like, oh, they're going to laugh you out of that room. They are. <laughs> but, but it's just one more small piece in the larger body of evidence that in my mind points to the reality of the teachings of scripture that, Hey, like how does a Christian stand on trial about to be mauled to death and just be peaceful? Yes. How does a, you know, like how does a, how does a Christian uh, spend day after day being tased and, and, you know, beaten by police and then still love them? And yep. still, you know, forgive them and still treat them with respect. You know, how, like the, these are things that you can't really explain in a human sense, in my opinion. Um, like maybe people can fabricate these things for a short time, but over the long haul, I just like to me, it's an indication that the Holy Spirit is real, that those who follow Jesus really do have the fruit of the spirit in their lives and that something like peace or patience or kindness or goodness uh, are are real mm. things that yeah. really come from God. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that along with that, Nathan, I think too, what you're saying is, is that the world is still trying to figure out what to make about pain and suffering. And mm. I think that gave me that that viewpoint and understanding of that there is purpose in my pain, and I can delight in suffering. I'm saying it's easy. I'm not saying none of that. But because of Christ suffered. And I think I'm not just saying that that has helped me through. I mean, I'm not making light of this. We have lost a son. Um, we have gone through some really hard and dark years in our marriage, in our life. Um, I've lost loved ones. I've, you know, um, so I think that and there's people that have gone through far worse. Right. But but it, it helps me understand there is purpose in that pain that God's doing something that I can't far beyond what I can understand. You know, as Paul would say, the Corinthian church is is that there's a there's 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 something that he's doing in my suffering mm -hmm. um, that is for our good and that, that is bringing him glory. And I can do that because of what the Bible says, that that Christ, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And if I fix my eyes on him, then I won't grow weary and give up. I don't just have to wonder and drown in that as I watch so many in the world doing, um, what do you make with this? And is God one sided? No, he's not just loving. He's not just, you know, powerful, but he is wise, right? Mm -hmm. He knows what he's doing. I think that has helped me walk through some dark seasons and times as well. So. Amen. Well, there you go, guys. That was probably a long time, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we, we, I'm thankful that uh, Paul, you were able to bring so much insight. Um, thank you for being here. And I, I hope that as you guys are walking away from this episode, you, uh, you're you seeing that the Bible doesn't just exist in like a, in a vacuum, um, that it has ties to history, it has ties to uh, archeology, span it has ties to our real world experience, yeah. it has ties to all of these things. Um, and in and of itself, it is a coherent document that all fits together like puzzle pieces, not just a not just a random, you know, scattering about of things, but but truly a, a, a really cohesive picture of all of human history uh, that you can find in those pages. So, uh, yeah, I, I hope that this is encouraging to you. And if you're if you're engaging someone who's going through deconstruction, um, I think my encouragement to you would be, hey, you have a basis for what you believe. Yeah. So be patient with the person who's going through deconstruction, but also if they're open, point them to these little things that say, hey, like there's this entire body of evidence that supports that what the Bible has to say is true and that the Bible itself is not just a fairy tale. Yeah, amen. I agree with that. And like I said, y'all pray and love, love mm -hmm. and serve. And, uh, you know, be patient. God's not in a hurry. He's growing us. So, Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of Fuel for the Harvest. Hope you have a great day.